So I'm very honored to welcome you all to this panel on human and labor rights um, and of course to have the opportunity to thank uh, the organizers and the Burke Institute and of course all the other centers without whom this conference could not be possible. Um, we have some last minute changes. Um, unfortunately, Filippo Rossi could not make it to the conference due to personal circumstances, and Natalie Davidson graciously agreed to uh, present her paper on alien tort statute litigation as transitional justice, um, and I am chairing instead of Natalie. <laughs> Um, so because I'm not listed in the program, I'll very shortly introduce myself so you know who you have in front of you. Um, I'm Miriam Streng. I'm a Global Trust uh, PhD fellow here um, and a, a PhD candidate at the Tsvemi Tal Center. I'm writing under the wonderful guidance of Professor Eyal Benvenisti. Um, I have an LLM from Columbia Law School and an LLM from... Uh, the University of Amsterdam and an LLB from there. Um, and I'm writing on the right to education of asylum seekers. So that's me. Um, some practical aspects. Uh, each speaker has 20 minutes to present. Um, and I should tell you all that my last name in Dutch uh, means strict. So I will be <laughs> living up to my last name when, when we get to the time allegation so we can actually hear everybody speak and have um, some time for uh, your wonderful questions. So uh, we'll start with uh, Natalie um, presenting on the Alien Tort Statute litigation as transitional justice. Um, Natalie Davidson is a PhD candidate at Tel Aviv University's law faculty here. Her dissertation revits, revisits um, transitional justice landmark human rights cases brought in U.S. courts under the alien tort statutes from a traditional uh, justice perspective. Um, she is a graduate of the joint LLB Metris program between King's College London and the Université Paris. Uh, and holds an LLM from LSE. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. So, uh, as Miriam said, I was sort of parachuted into this panel <laughs> at the last minute. So, I hope my presentation isn't off topic. Uh, but it does have to do with law and transition and human rights, so I think we should be okay. So I study alien tort statute litigation, and in the rest of this talk, I'll refer to it as ATS litigation. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, it's a um, piece of legislation uh, in the United States that was interpreted between 1980 and 2013 as granting uh, American federal courts universal jurisdiction in tort litigation. It enabled victims of gross human rights violations to sue perpetrators in U.S. federal courts for damages. Once uh, the lawsuits began to target uh, multinational corporations from the mid-90s, however, this whole line of case law triggered a lot of opposition, a lot of discussion, and finally in April of 2013, the U.S. Supreme Court, in the case of Kyobel, interpreted the statute in a very restrictive way, such that it now requires a strong link between the case and the United States. So this is uh, up here the uh, dominant interpretation of the case of Kyobel, foreign cubed cases, meaning cases with a foreign plaintiff, a foreign defendant for facts, human rights violations occurring on foreign soil, could no longer be brought under the alien tort statute. No, this is no longer universal jurisdiction. So I'm interested in ATS litigation um, in its implications for transitional justice. I'm looking at it as a rich experiment over three decades with universal jurisdiction in civil cases. And I'm interested in how what how it's worked out as a, um, how it's interacted or how it's worked out as a mechanism of transitional justice. And for the purposes of this talk today, when I say transitional justice, I mean uh, the production of a historical narrative 
about political violence. In other work in my dissertation, I, it's more of a sociology of law project where I actually see how in certain countries what impact it's had on transitional justice institutions. So um, human rights and transitional justice mechanisms such as uh, truth commissions and criminal trials have been um, sharply criticized for producing distorted historical narratives about um, uh, political violence, narratives that are simplistic, that obscure the structural and profound causes of repression, and in particular, what I'm going to focus on today, uh, the responsibility of countries in the global north for violence and repression in the south. So I set out, uh, and I was interested to see how ATS litigation has operated in this respect. Um, what I do is I revisit the two landmark seminal cases in ATS litigation having to do uh, where um, state officials were sued for torture, Philardega and Marcos. Philardega concerns torture by the police under the Strassner regime in Paraguay, and this is the landmark, the first ATS case in 1980 that established that uh, U.S. courts had uh, universal jurisdiction. Marcos was a class action by 10,000 victims of repression under the martial law regime of Ferdinand Marcos. In each case, uh, the defendant was held liable and extraordinarily high damages awarded. And therefore, these cases are still today applauded uh, by human rights scholars for having broken new legal ground, promoted human rights accountability. And I offer a different lens. I ask how might we assess them if we look at them through the lens of transitional justice as places where uh, narratives about political violence are produced. So among lawyers, these cases are typical foreign cubed cases. A foreign defendant, foreign victims happened in faraway lands. But actually, if we place them in historical context, we see that these cases are very much connected to the United States. The torture in each case was perpetrated uh, by a regime that was a staunch ally of the United States during the Cold War uh, in the Western Bloc. And according to most historical accounts, it's pretty uncontroversial that the huge amount of political, economic, and military assistance provided by the U.S. to e uh, each of these regimes was key to each regime's survival and ability to repress, in addition to suggestions not yet proven that the U.S. is directly linked to the torture through, tr for example, training um, of uh, in interrogation techniques by the CIA. So at the same time, there were, of course, different U.S. administrations during the Cold War, different parts of the government uh, at any given time that have different opinions. And some parts of the U.S. government, particularly in the 70s, exerted much pressure on each regime to respect human rights. So my question is, can we get a glimpse of this very complicated story, you know, the, the complex U.S. position vis-a-vis -vis each regime? In ATS litigation, I'm not talking about legal liability. Obviously, neither the U.S. nor its officials were sued in these cases. I'm talking about an important byproduct of the litigation, the historical narrative. Now, contrary to the critical scholars that I uh, rely on to design my research question, I don't assume that because the litigation took place in an American court that U.S. responsibility was necessarily whitewashed. I draw uh, from scholars. I draw heavily on scholarship, on the representation of history in Holocaust trials, um, and I do a close reading of what happened at trial, what was said, in court, in the legal documents, in legal argumentation, um, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, uh, in these two cases. And what I found, uh, just in a nutshell, is that in each of these cases the role of the U.S. was whitewashed. Like other groundbreaking cases about political violence uh, since Nuremberg, the historical narrative in these cases was impoverished because of a combination of legal and political constraints, namely the plaintiffs and the courts need to bolster their legitimacy in exercising a controversial form of jurisdiction. So what I'm, the, what I'm going to tell you in the remaining time, basically I'd like to suggest that there's a trade-off here. Um, between accountability and historical narrative, that it's precisely those elements 
of the case law that make it possible to win the case and to hold the defendant accountable for torture that impoverish the historical narrative. And I believe this is true not just of these two landmark cases, but of later cases as well um, in ATS uh, case law. And so I'm going to demonstrate this mainly because of uh, lack of time and because we have a strict uh, chair through the Marcos case. I'll just say a few words. I'm not really going to demonstrate anything here, but just give you a taste. A few words in the Philardega case. I'll just say that in Philardega, because of legal argumentation strategies and in order to convince the judge to accept the case, the plaintiffs portrayed their lawsuit as compatible with U.S. foreign policy. U.S. foreign policy in, their, in the story they presented to the court had been a consistent over the decades policy of trying to eradicate torture um, and they presented Carter's pro-human rights policy not as a sharp shift in foreign policy but as a strengthening of what was going on in previous decades which would sound quite surprising to historians of you know, U.S. involvement in Latin America in the 60s. In addition, um, the courts in the case presented this lawsuit as one about individual violence. This was a story in the way they presented it as uh, this, a cruel individual, cruel policeman who abused his position uh, and tortured the victim uh, rather than a story about systematic repression by a state, a regime which happened to be a U.S. ally. So this strategy of individualizing the case helped the plaintiffs avoid doctrines such as sovereign immunity, um, but so it, it was good for holding the torture accountable, but in terms of historical narrative, it means that any connection to the U.S. in the story was blurred. Now, Marcos was a class action. This required proving a, a policy of repression. So it was clearly the regime that was being judged and the U.S. connection couldn't be as easily swept under the carpet. And in fact, uh, during the trial, the relationship of the United States to the Marcos regime was extensively discussed. But here, too, the discussion led to a whitewashing of U.S. involvement in repression, both because of legal and political constraints. Marcos was sued under the doctrine of command responsibility, which, as interpreted by the court in this case, required proving either that Marcos himself had ordered the torture and uh, disappearance, etc., of the victims, or that knowing about the abuses committed by his security forces and having the power to prevent them, he had done nothing to prevent them. So in most cases, because there were 10,000 victims, the plaintiffs argued uh, the knowledge track. Okay, Marcos knew and did nothing. So they needed to prove that he knew. How did they prove Marcos's knowledge? knowledge? He knew because the U.S. government was constantly bringing up the subject and telling him to stop. So that's the story that um, the plaintiffs presented. This is just one of the uh, opening statements by one of the plaintiff uh, lawyers. So the plaintiffs brought, uh, you know, former U.S. diplomats and ambassadors um, as expert witnesses, and they described how the United States had set up a broad and organized effort to improve the human rights situation. Um, and so here, too, the distorted picture is it's not that these things were lies. It's that you only present one side of the story um, and you, you completely lose uh, the, the, the extent, the huge extent of U.S. support for repression under Marcos. You can get a measure of the distortion when you see how Philippine human rights organizations which participated in the trial changed their story themselves. Uh, this excerpt here is from a 1984 report of the leading Philippine human rights organization under Marcos, Task Force Detainees, discussing the visit of a former U.S. Attorney General to uh, Philippine security forces um, where the, where the uh, American official was uh, confronted with torture equipment and told by the Philippine officer that he learned the techniques in the United States. At trial, however, uh, Sister Mariani Di Maranan, uh, the chair 
of this human rights organization appeared as expert witness on behalf of the plaintiffs, and she told a very similar story with a different date, but a very similar story about this visit, but in it she doesn't mention, of course, any U.S. training, and to the contrary, she depicts American outrage. So here the Americans are the moral witnesses, uh, the denouncers of human rights abuses. So I'm not presenting the uh, human rights report as more accurate than the trial testimony. I'm just pointing to a change in the story, which suggests, in my view, limits on what you can say in a U.S. court or what you could say in a U.S. court in the 80s. In what was probably an attempt to affect this particular witness's credibility in the eyes of a jury, and I, I am sorry, I should have mentioned there was a jury, there are jury trials in uh, civil litigation in federal courts in the United States. So uh, to affect her credibility, the defense counsel tried to show the jury that she and her organization had used in the past anti-American rhetoric. And so he placed before her in cross-examination one of the organization's report that used anti-American rhetoric and asked her what it meant. And at the uh, plaintiff attorney's um, request, the court cut the conversation short. But defense counsel did not tr just try to discredit the plaintiff's witnesses. So you have, on the one hand, the plaintiffs who tried to prove Marcus's knowledge of human rights abuses by proving that uh, the United States exerted pressure on Marcos. Conversely, the defense tried to prove that there had been no extensive human rights violations, and their argument was that there could not have been extensive human rights violations because the United States supported Marcos extensively, and how could we have supported them if uh, they were repressive? So uh, defense counsel, through cross-examination of the plaintiff's witness, tried invariably constantly throughout the trial to bring up the issue of U.S. aid. And every single time, plaintiff counsel objected and the court cut the conversation short. The one or two times when he actually did manage to raise the issue of the extensive U.S. aid provided to the Marcos regime, um, the expert witnesses uh, explained they justified this aid as a form of rent as a humanitarian gesture, as good diplomatic practice. So you get a completely distorted picture of the U.S. involvement with the Marcos regime because both of the th uh, plaintiff's theory of legal liability but also because of rules of re relevance. The topic of U.S. aid was declared by the court when the defense counsel tried to bring it up as not relevant. But these legal constraints don't operate mechanically to produce a distortive narrative. There are also cultural assumptions and strategic factors at work. So you notice here in the story I've told you that each side's case turns implicitly on what the U.S. position on the Marcos regime was, which I see as reflecting ethnocentric assumptions on the part of the U.S. lawyers arguing the case. And the court's consistent rulings that discussions of U.S. aid were irrelevant to the case are highly questionable because the court allowed an um, expert on behalf of the plaintiffs to testify that at one point a small amount of U.S. aid had been reduced, and this as evidence that the U.S. Uh, was putting pressure on Marcos. Um, and in fact, the lead plaintiff lawyer explained to me, he compared the whole issue of the U.S. involvement with the Marcos regime with the issue of race in the O.J. Simpson trial, and he said, um, what you try to do at trial is keep out extraneous events that could appeal to prejudice. And this is what he tried to do, and he sees the court as having been supportive of that. So in short, I, th I hope I've convinced you that from this case at least, it seems that for these inevitably political cases to be accepted in foreign domestic courts, it's useful to whitewash the forum's dirty hands. In fact, it's precisely Sorry, I accidentally Oh, good. Okay. It's precisely where UF courts have refused to adjudicate ATS claims that US complicity in violence has been made most explicit, such as in the 2007 case of Corey versus Caterpillar, where the Ninth Circuit was unwilling to hear a lawsuit against Caterpillar. Um, Caterpillar was sued by the family of Rachel Corey and uh, Palestinians. Uh, for having sold bulldozers to the IDF, bulldozers that were then used by the IDF to demolish homes and kill activists. For the U.S. court, because Caterpillar's sales 
of bulldozers to Israel were paid for directly by the United States as part of the extensive military aid that Israel receives from the United States. Allowing the action to proceed would require the judicial branch to question the political branch's decision to grant extensive military aid to Israel. So you have, okay, they're not going to deal with the issue, but the issue is on the table and it's, it's, uh, it's labeled um, explicitly. So the good news is that outside of the law, in public discourse, such as uh, press coverage, I did a study of press coverage of these two cases in Paraguay and the Philippines. Um, the role of the United States was not uh, obscured. In each country, there is a long tradition of leftist criticism of the United States, and that did not disappear simply because this case, these cases were brought. But if we now include the United States in the picture, then the relevant community for transitional justice purposes is not just Paraguay or the Philippines, but also the United States. And I want to suggest that for the American legal community at least, these cases have legitimated U.S. Uh, neocolonialism during the Cold War in the Western Bloc. Among international and human rights lawyers in the, in the United States, whether they are right-leaning or left-leaning, like Ralph Steinhardt here, um, these cases are not discussed as cases concerning U.S. allies. These are foreign cubed cases, cases, these are cases where we judge others. So ironically, um, the U.S. Supreme Court's recent restriction of ATS litigation in Kyo Bill to cases with some connection to the U.S. So that decision was perceived as a setback for human rights account, uh, advocates, as a uh, reduction in human rights accountability. But maybe that's good news in terms of the historical narrative, because maybe now to get a case through the courts, a plain, uh, some creative plaintiff lawyer will need to argue that there's some kind of U.S. connection in the case, maybe not of the political branches, but of corporations, some other uh, U.S. involvement, therefore highlighting uh, American responsibility. Thank you very much.